Today we are interviewing Eric Betsy, American scientist who won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2014. Eric Betsy, welcome and thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. You won the Nobel Prize for demonstrating that photoactivated fluorescent molecules could revolutionize the resolution of optical microscopes. Can you explain why that was a scientific milestone? So um, the limits on being able to see small things in cells have been established since the late 19th century by Ernst Abbe as being about 200 times bigger than the size of the single molecules inside of a cell. And so um, people thought that was a fundamental limit and I and my co-laureates found different ways of going beyond that limit, this photoactivation principle is one to basically take us to close to the molecular level. And that's important because um, the inanimate molecules that are expressed in a cell by some magical process self-assemble and create something that eats, moves, and reproduces. And these tools can be useful in trying to make that connection between molecular biology and cell biology to finally unravel how that happens. So after your PhD at Cornell University and your early career at Bell Labs, you decided to leave the academic world and uh, to join a small private company unrelated to your previous work. How did this impact your creativity and uh, determine your discovery afterwards? So I think the, the main things I learned, I, the company I actually worked with was my father's machine tool company. And so they would make uh, large machines for the auto industry to make high volume of like brake calipers or intake manifolds. And uh, um, I developed a new type of machine tool there which failed spectacularly in the marketplace. And, and the lesson I learned from that and some other products I developed there is the importance of understanding the final application of the technologies you develop. I feel that one of the base problems in academic science, particularly for tool developers, is they tend to do things because they can do it, not necessarily because they should do it. And I think the lesson I learned there was to really talk to the customer first, to find out what the, what the real problems are and, um, and focus on those. And my customers are basically biologists. So it's the contact with the biologist that informs every new direction that we take with our technologies. So you currently work at Genelia Research Campus in Virginia, and you came today at Ecole Polytechnique to give a conference on imaging life at high spatial temporal resolution. Right. What are, according to you, the main challenges of optical microscopy nowadays? So um, we've made a lot of progress. I mean, the field as a whole in the last decade in improving microscopes. And the, <coughs> the one that got me the Nobel Prize was certainly part of that because that was dealing with the spatial resolution aspect of things. But a cell is moving if it's alive. And so you need to have fast imaging tools. And then a cell is very sensitive to the application of light. So you need to do tricks to make it so that you don't cook the cell when you look at it. Mm -hmm. And then um, another major aspect that we've made some inroads in is, is that cells, although they've largely been studied in isolation because it's most tractable to existing technologies, don't exist that way in nature. They're part of organisms. And the interactions between cells are just as important as what happens inside a single cell. So we develop different adaptive optical techniques to be able to get good imaging performance even in those challenging environments. Now going forward, there's still several holy grails that people have not been able to, to succeed with yet. Um, so one is um, there's 10,000 different types of proteins in a cell. And even with fluorescent techniques, we usually look at them one, two, maybe three at a time but hundreds of players may be involved in any particular process like, you know, vesicle trafficking or cell division or stuff. And so it would be wonderful if one could find a way of following and identifying hundreds of proteins at the same time. How we're going to do that, I don't know, but that would be a, 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 another possible Nobel Prize to the guy who figures that out. And the last thing is um, probably the most useful way of studying 
cells in a microscope is through fluorescence microscopy, that you tag the, the proteins you care about with a little glowing handle, and so you see that as your, as, as your signal inside of your cell. But although fluorescence is incredibly powerful, and, and um, you know, protein engineers and physical chemists are making more and more tools available out of that technology. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with fluorescence because you're putting a, basically a bowling ball on, of another molecule attached to the molecule you want, and that can perturb things and so forth. So a number of groups have for at least a decade been trying to find, quote, label-free ways of imaging in cells. And there's been some successes, but they really don't have the sort of breadth of sensitivity to different things that fluorescence offers. So again, another challenge for the future, but who knows how we're going to get there, would be to do everything I've just discussed up till now, but now do it without the fluorescent labels at all. And that would be amazing if we could do that. Well, thank you very much for this fluorescent insight. Okay. Uh, do you have a piece of advice to give to Ecole Polytechnic students who consider doing their career in scientific research? Would you encourage them? I, I would, I mean, but again, I think you have to look in your heart and decide that this is what you want to do. Um, I know a lot of young students who are in science either by inertia or, or pressure from their parents or because they did well in school as kids or whatever. I think the most important thing isn't necessarily that you become a scientist, although it's great if you, that's your passion, but the most important thing is to follow your passion. Find the thing that you really care about, whether it's scientific communication or whether it's being a chef or whatever, and then throw your body and soul at it and work hard. And that's really the recipe for success in any walk of life. Eric Betzig, thank you very much. Sure, happy to talk to you. Thank you.